Hi, I'm George Cow, and I'm really happy to be here with Molly Gordon. So Molly and I have gone back quite a few years. I'm not even remembering. It's probably almost close to 10 years by this point. And Molly has, well, first I want to say hi to you, Molly. Great to have you here. Thank you. Hi, George. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So uh, let me kind of share with the, the viewers um, your background a bit. We are going to be talking about um, sort of the power of coaching today. So for all of you who are coaches and who are transformational um, service providers of some kind, you work with clients to facilitate uh, some positive change uh, within their life. Uh, this will be an interesting conversation for you. Um, Molly has been coaching uh, actively since 1996. And of course, she's certified. And she not only is, has been coaching um, since 96, she also has been training uh, coaches for years and mentoring coaches. And that's really her passion these days. Um, she is also passionate about social justice. And I'll have her explain how that's related to coaching. And uh, she really um, wants to mentor coaches uh, because coaches, a lot of coaches are leaving a lot on the table in their, in their work with clients. They don't really see um, what they have to give in themselves. And also they don't really understand. A lot of coaches don't, don't, um, don't, aren't skilled in, in, in capture and seeing the capacities that the client has in themselves and really bringing that alive. So Molly, welcome to this conversation. Thanks for being here. Thank you, George. It's wonderful to be with you. Yeah. So, um, there's a lot we can talk about, but uh, we, we mentioned a little bit on social justice, and I want to kind of start there, and then we can go into, go into um, coaching skills, et cetera. So uh, how does you were, you know, before we started recording, you were mentioning the roots of coaching and how that relates to social justice. Maybe you can talk about that a bit. Right. Hmm. As I've looked more and more deeply at social justice issues in this country, you know, I came into it as a well-intentioned, good person wanting to see justice done for more people. And there's an element in that of um, when some circles is called white saviorism. I mean, I genuinely, I came in, I'm the good person, I'm going to help. I, I intended well, but I was blind to I was blind to the richness of lived experience, uh, understanding, spiritual understanding, philosophical understanding, economic understanding, all kinds of understanding that marginalized communities of all sorts, whether they're marginalized on the basis of gender, sexual preference, uh, neurology, uh, ethnicity, race, whatever it is, Every human being has something to bring the ta to the table about being human. And we have left huge segments of society and millions of, in, of individuals with access to intelligence and wisdom and compassion and information. There's a way in which, George, it looks to me like every being on the planet is here as a teacher. And right now, 55% of the teachers aren't being listened to. In fact, if we expand it to the natural world, 90% of the teachers on the planet are not being heard from. So I'm committed to social justice, not just because I want justice to be done, which I do, but because as a living being, I want the benefit of all of the wisdom, all of the beauty, all of the intelligence, all of the possibility. And I'm sorry, but white people can't deliver that. Yeah. And the roots of coaching, uh, you mentioned, are a lot of people don't realize this, but yeah, share more. Well, it, I have a sense, this is my story, so it's made up. My sense is that coaching emerged as a part of a process of collective and individual evolution, that it's a, a developmental uh, phenomena in the world, and that I felt that for a long time. And as I look more deeply at like black feminist thinkers, indigenous thinkers, I see some of the threads 
of early coaching, some of the glimmerings we had about human potential, some of the glimmers we have about alternate ways of knowing, even some of the methodologies we use around values and uh, communication and sharing, those are, uh, there's a lot of, there are models for that in indigenous and, and uh, other communities. And some of the coaching models have actually been drawn from those uh, without permission, which is problematic. But there's just there's a trove of understanding. I think that, um, I don't wanna make an overgeneralization here, but I observe that among black and brown people, there tends to be, uh, there are often understandings about community and group identity and how to support each other that I find lacking and contemporary white society. I think that, that a lot of the pain at work might be addressed if we had some of the collective understanding that some of the marginalized people seem to have. And I am, I, this is a new glimmer to me. I'm just kind of going, holy cow, we're trying to solve problems that other people have solved. Or we're trying to understand things that other people have some understanding of, and we need to bring that in. So I think there's a collective, communal, whether we call it the collective unconscious, collective intelligence, uh, community, all of those things I think are very important to, community, to co coaching and that uh, marginalized communities often have a better understanding of them. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so when it comes to uh, how you coach or how you mentor coaches. What's, what have you noticed that a lot of coaches um, are underdeveloped in? I mean, what, what kinds of capacities or you know, ways, of, ways of doing their work? Yeah. What I would say is that coaches are underdeveloped in the area of mystery. Hmm. That there's a tendency, I think it has based in something very honorable, coaches want to deliver value. And it's a very human thing to think that that value resides in you. If I'm responsible for delivering value, it's up to me to find the value and bring it over to your house. But as you know, coaching is more of a collaborative, uh, co-creative process of revealing value, discovering value, uncovering value. And I hold that as a very real dimension of coaching. And I think it's the most overlooked and underappreciated dimension for newer coaches. I think many come in with a, an intuition of it, they believe in it, but it still exists kind of in a magical realm. And I see new coaches either just like, close your eyes and tap your heels three times. <laughs> I wanna go home, I wanna go home and it will happen, magical thinking, or, not accessing those resources at all. And there's a, it takes discernment and practice to be able to deliberately dial in a fruitful space of not knowing, a fruitful space of wonder, a fruitful space of exploration. And I love listening for that and helping uh, coaches notice that it's available. Hmm. So, um... For the person who is feeling on the hook of the, for delivering value, um, how can we kind of let that burden go a bit more? Yeah. yeah. I think you know, the method for letting it go is going to vary widely. Uh, I think each coach can look to his or her spiritual tradition and the spiritual doesn't need to mean religious, but whatever your understanding of how intuition, inspiration, creativity, renewal, resilience, the whole uh, complex of traits that are rooted in what I would call the spiritual dimension of being human. So look to your own tradition. I don't think any tradition has a corner on the market and every tradition provides a way in to look at it. So look at that. Challenge yourself to 
see both when you're coaching and outside of coaching, look for the resilience, creativity, intelligence in every human being you meet. The definition of coaching of ICF has embedded in it, I think it's in the prologue actually, that we believe clients to be whole, creative, and resourceful. My edit is coaches realize, no believing about it, realize that all human beings, this is not a special thing about coaching clients, all human beings are creative, competent, and resourceful, whole creative and resourceful. Now, there are days in which the person in front of me does not look whole, creative, and resourceful. It's on me to engage with that and still speak to the part of them that is. I have a note actually on my computer, awakeness talking to awakeness. This is my basic guideline for coaching. And I challenge myself to find the awakeness in me every day and to look for the awakeness and recognize the awakeness in everyone I meet. Mm, that's beautiful. And of course, it reminds you of namaste, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. You know. And to engage that, not as magical, everyone right. is, you know, but really challenge yourself. If I believed that, what's the question I would ask? Mm. If I believed that, mm. how much more silence might I allow in my coaching session? Mm. Uh, co questions is one of the things that I think coaches, is, coaches are good at. What is a question you find yourself enjoying asking in your sessions? Mm -hmm. The only one that's popping up persistently right now is it's an old one. And Michael Bungay Stanier has, has made this very popular. It's anything else, <laughs> if you know, or what else? Just that opening for more space. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> I, I, I know that really that the skill is, is really within the, the interaction and the conversation. It's not, it's not a script. You know, that right. You approach the, the, yeah. the ICF competency actually related to questioning is powerful questioning, not mm. powerful questions. Mm. There is no question right. on a list that is right. powerful. There's only right. the act of questioning. Yes, yes. And what have you? What has surprised you about um, working with working working with clients? I mean, you know, we are here to. I mean, as coaches, I, I, I call myself a coach in a kind of a, a very uh, non-certified uh, way, I guess I would say. <clears throat> but, um, uh, you know, as coaches, we, we're, as people who are working to bring, to strengthen, to empower our clients, what, what has surprised you in your work to, you know, well, I guess maybe that's a general question. Like, what has surprised you in your work with clients? Like, what's, what's been, uh, yeah, what's, what's been interesting for you? I think what surprises me is that excuse me, a little goes a long way, hmm. you know, um, I had a, a new client uh, last week and She just had a little, little insight, a little shift in her understanding about anxiety mm. and about, uh, she came in wanting to think more positively. She's a person who's had cancer and uh, has had a, uh, like me, a bilateral mastectomy. She's been through chemo and radiation. Her, her prospect is really good. However, like many people uh, after a cancer diagnosis, she was walking around under sort of a cone of guilt. Negative thinking gave me cancer. And if I can't control my negative thinking going forward, it will come back. Mm. It's like, wow, I don't want any human being walking around bearing the burden of their, for their thinking. But 
so I just asked her, I said, does it look to you like you have power over that? And I allowed her space to sit in her answer. Her answer was no, it didn't look like she had power, but she had come in thinking that that was a problem and even an indictment. I should have power over my thinking. And she left going, hey, sue me, I don't have power over my thinking. And negative thoughts can run through my mind all day long. I don't have to, I don't have to buy that. Right. So it's like taking it on, it, it just, that little shift in understanding of her relationship to her own thinking, hugely beneficial to her. Even a year ago, I think I would have tried, I would have wanted to drive past that and build out that understanding and make her interpretation of that resemble mine. And now I see the value of, of letting that unfold in her in whatever unique way it does. So I'm not trying to control the flowering of the understanding the way I used to. Wow, that's, that's powerful, yeah. Is there another um, client story that comes to mind of some kind of um, transformational moment or experience? What would just pops into my mind is another new client, uh, the a gentleman who's mid to late career, uh, just to his surprise, he's just found himself in the middle of a divorce. He's getting a divorce that wasn't in his life plan. Uh, he's quite successful. Uh, and for the first time in many years as a t coach, I found myself going through my hard drive looking for values exercises. You know, we're going like back to the very beginning, um, the beginning of my work as a coach and kind of the beginning of many people's journey. And I'm sharing that as an example, you never know where clients are gonna come in. As a coach develops, ideally we should always meet our clients where they are. So the, I never know what a client's gonna need from me. That's all I'm trying to say. Mm. Every situation is unique. One day we're doing a values exercise, the next day we're making a pro and con checklist. You know, there's, there is no right way to coach. In fact, I was reviewing a new book by a coach the other day and it's got a lot of good stuff in it, but it tried to make its thesis, the thesis for coaching. It's like, we don't have to do that. You could write a great book about Thai cooking. You do not have to make it about converting me to Thai cooking. <laughs> I can still eat a hot dog and Thai and Chinese and Indian and, you know, <laughs> and in coaching, it's like you keep arguing over the right way to do it. Like, no, let's cook. Let's open this up instead of shut it down. Wow, that's great. I think this applies, you know, not only to coaching, but healing, you know, and, and transformation and of all different kinds. So. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be the, the one, the one way. Um, so if anybody's watching this and saying, well, Molly, do you, how do we, how does somebody work with you? Like, what's the, what's the next step if they wanted to, to explore further with you? Right. Uh, I have a website, shaboominc.com. And on that website, it's a contact form. Anyone who thinks they might want to do coaching or coach mentoring with me, just shoot me a note and uh, I have no obligation, uh, initial conversation to explore whether or not we should work together or whether or not I have other resources for you that you can use. Great. And it's uh, S-H-A-B-O-O-M-I-N-C.com, Shaboom Inc. And I just wanted to quickly put it on the screen so people can see it. Um, so that's how it's spelled, Shaboom Perfect. Inc. Shaboom Inc.com. Great. Yep. And you've got a contact page. Uh, uh, somewhere in there. Somewhere. I think, it's, I think <laughs> My, it's probably on the bottom of the about page. It's also ah, on there the bottom go. of the yes. page. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's true. Probably, probably, yeah, there you go. Well, how, how to yeah. reach me. There we go. Great. There we go. Okay, cool. All right. Um, anything else before we conclude this conversation? Anything, any other kind of wisdom to leave us with? 
No, it's just a pleasure to speak with you, George. Yeah, thank you. Same here. Thanks, Molly. And I'll be sure to put the link in the notes of the video. And uh, you're also active on your Facebook profile. I don't know if you want people to follow you there or, you know. People are, feel free to follow me on Facebook. You know, the last month or two, I've been on Twitter more. I, oh, I go great. back and forth. I bounce yes. around, but I'm at Shaboom on Twitter. Great, great. Well, I'll be sure to link that as well. All right. Well, thank you, Molly. You're welcome. Thank you, George.